Good morning, everyone. God bless your hearts. It's good to be back together. Uh, for those of you in uh, that's on this broadcast, uh, you may not know that we canceled our service today, and that's why we're having it live. Uh, it was just a, uh, a precautionary measure, and it's probably an extreme measure, but we did have a few people that were exposed to people who had symptoms at that time. We didn't know if any of them actually had the virus or not. But since there were so many people in our church that <clears throat> had been around uh, somewhere in the proximity of these people, we just felt that it'd be better to be safe than sorry. So we would know answers on it this week for sure. And, and uh, so I felt a few days uh, and one day of canceling the service wouldn't be too much to ask to be careful. So that's why we're having live service today. And, and uh, anyway, it's good to be with y'all. And um, I'm gonna sort of delve right in because I, I don't wanna be too lengthy today, but um, I wanna talk on a subject that I haven't actually covered in a long time. Um, and the reason for it is I had a pastor contact me this week who told me he was being challenged on Matthew, the 27th chapter, in the 52nd verse. So if you want to turn with me, uh, in other words, we're going to be dealing with the resurrection uh, and that that was mentioned uh, in Matthew 27, 52. There are some people, of course, before I came to this body of people, I never heard of the teaching on that. And, and uh, so one of the things that this pastor told me, he said, I was raised in this and I was born and all my life, listened to this uh, teaching and I just always accepted it. But he said, you know, when I was challenged on it, I had to really dig down. And in fact, in him talking to me, it almost sounded like he, somebody had almost convinced him against it. Hopefully, when I got through talking to him, uh, I erased that. I hope I hope I would be able to close the mouth of gainsayers. I, I'm convinced of this doctrine. I think it's very, very reasonable, and I think we have many scriptures on it. So, without any further ado, if you'll turn with me to Matthew 27, 52, uh, we'll, we'll start the 51st verse. And, of course, this is talking about when Jesus died on the cross, uh, Isaiah, I mean, Matthew 27, 51 says, And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from top to bottom, and the earth did quake and the rocks rent. And the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose and came out of the graves after his resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared unto many. Now that's all that says in those those two verses uh, one of the things you have to notice in the 20 50 second verse and the graves were opened uh wait i'm uh no 53 and, and they came out of the graves after his resurrection i think that after his resurrection is very important to note because there would have been no reason for him to come up exactly with him when he resurrected, which was three days after he died. And uh, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you some scriptures and I'll give you some of the rebuttal that this pastor was getting. And, uh, but I haven't just, you know, I've alluded to this many times because it is a regular teaching among us. However, I do think there are men among us that, that either, were never taught it, uh, and some maybe never heard it. And uh, especially after, you know, there was a division in this body for many years, and after this body came back together, I believe that there were men that, at least portions of these scriptures, they didn't, they never were taught on, and they, they didn't see it that way. So, um, I think I'll start off in Job, the 16th chapter, if y'all would, if y'all want to get, you might, some of you brethren may want to get a pencil and write some of this down because 
you know, you may, I don't know whenever I'll go over it again. So in the 14th chapter of, of Job, in uh, the 13th verse, we, we read this scripture often in, in uh, at funerals and, and mo most of the time at grave sites. It says, and this is Job speaking, he says, Oh, that thou wouldest hide me in the grave and thou wouldest keep me secret until thy watch be passed, thy wrath, I mean, be passed, that thou wouldest appoint me in a set time and remember me. If a man die, shall he live again? All the days of my appointed time will I wait till my change comes. Thou shalt call, and I will answer thee. Thou wilt have a desire to the work of thine hands. So, obviously, Paul, I mean, Job, obviously had a hope in a resurrection. If you'll if you'll look with me to the the let's see the night the nineteenth verse, um, and uh, let's see what verse that would be. Yes, nineteen and twenty five. It says, "For I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that He shall stand at the latter day upon the earth." Now, a lot of people would wonder, when is this latter day? Well, if you go to the New Testament and study the last days and the end of time, those two phrases, you'll find that it, all of them was talking about back there. It was talking about the last days of the Jewish world and the last days are the end of that world, the Jewish world. It wasn't talking about the end down here. That's one of the things you have to understand that this this Bible talking about two worlds. It's talking about the Jewish world and the Gentile world. And so, uh, but Paul was, I mean, Job was prophesying here. He said, I know my Redeemer liveth and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. And though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh, I shall see God whom I shall see for myself and mine eyes shall behold and not another, though my reins be consumed within me. Now these verses I've read you in Job are, are uh, they're not necessarily proof in any way that this is talking about the, the these dead that came out of the graves in Matthew 27, 52, but what it does prove is, is that Job had the hope of a resurrection. And so, but these other scriptures I'm going to include here, I think will solidify the fact that there was a time of a resurrection of the worthy saints of the Old Testament after Jesus's resurrection. So let's, let's look at that a little bit further. Turn with me to Isaiah now, to the 26th chapter. And if any of you theologians, you brethren, ministers in my church or anyone as far as that's concerned listening uh, have a comment or or if you have a scripture that I may not cover you're more than welcome to to uh, comment and, and uh, give me the scripture I, I use all the help I can get okay in the 26th chapter of, of Isaiah and um Let me see where I want to start here. Yeah. Um, now this chapter is talking about uh, uh, starting in the first verse. It says, In that day shall this song be sung in the land of Judah. We have a strong city. Salvation will God appoint for walls and books. Open ye the gates that the righteous nation which keepeth the trust may enter in. Uh, th this chapter, if you read it 
you will see that it's talking about the day of Pentecost. This is when a nation is born in a day. Um, and so, and, and they bring forth without any travail. That's talking about those that were born on the day of Pentecost. And then in verse 19, it says, thy dead men shall live together with my dead body shall they arise. Awake and sing you that dwell in the dust for the dew is as the dew of herbs and the earth shall cast out the dead. See, one of the, one of the uh, questions this brother had was, is that, you know, he said, well, uh, they've been telling me maybe this verse is talking about Israel, not Jesus. Well, you always have to twist this scripture to get it to say that because it's talking about with his dead body shall they arise. Awake, sing thou that dwell in the dust. You know, this is, <laughs> these are those that went back to dust. For thy dew is as the dew of herbs and the earth shall cast out the dead. Come, my people, enter into thy chambers and shut thy doors about thee. Hide thyself as it were for a little moment until the indignation be overpassed. For behold, the Lord cometh out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity, the earth, also shall disclose her blood and shall no more cover her slain. And then notice the first verse of chapter 27 says, in that day, the Lord with his sore and great uh, and strong sword, the word of God, shall punish Leviathan, the piercing servant, even Leviathan, that crooked servant, and he shall slay the dragon that is in the sea. That's, that's, Leviathan. It's what he's calling here. Isaiah's calling in his prophecy. Uh, and, and so he's putting a day on it. He's putting the day of the Lord. When the Lord came to the church on the day of Pentecost, and remember it was after his resurrection. Those saints didn't resurrect when Jesus resurrected, but they resurrected after according to what it says. Okay, so uh, then um, let's look in, in Malachi 3. I'm trying to give you these, these, uh, these scriptures. Excuse me, I know I've got Malachi in my Bible. I'm just, I was having, I my, had my thought got carried away on me there for a moment. Uh, okay, now Malachi, of course, if you look at the, uh, look at the very first verse in, in Malachi 3, it says, Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom you seek shall suddenly come out of his temple, even the messenger of the covenant whom you delight in behold he shall come saith the Lord of hosts but who may abide the day of his coming and who shall stand when he appeareth for he's like a refiner's fire and a fuller's soap and he'll sit as a refiner and purifier of silver and, and shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver that they may offer unto the Lord an offering of righteousness uh, so <clears> that <throat> this is talking about, uh, John the Baptist coming as a forerunner of Jesus. And of course, Malachi's whole, the whole prophecy of Malachi's is prophesying of the coming of the Lord. Then in verse 16, it says, then they that feared the Lord spake often to one another and the Lord hearkened and heard it and a book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared the Lord and that thought upon his name. King James Version, because it's not in the original scriptures, it's just actually they that feared the Lord spake often. He, he's going back if you read the whole third. Okay, we're back on. I'm sorry for that interruption. I, I really don't know uh, 
we've had that happen last Thursday and, and I've got new uh, Wi-Fi ordered so that I don't know why I'm showing I've got a full signal and I've changed locations, but anyway, hopefully we won't have another interruption today. Anyway, I'll go back and I'm just saying that uh, they that feared the Lord spake often to one another. God heard it and a, bu a book of remembrance was written for them that feared the Lord. Then verse 17 says, and they shall be mine, saith the Lord of hosts, in that day when I make up my jewels and I will spare them as a man spareth his own son that serveth him. So here, God remembers those that feared him, spake often to one another about him, worshiped him. God was mindful of that. He heard them and he remembered them. It says a book of remembrance. It just means a record. God, I don't think God's even got any literal writings in heaven that he needs a reminder. I think God knows everything. And so, but he remembers those in the day that he makes up his jewels. Now, uh, let me think about that here just for a minute. Um, it's in Ezekiel 16. That's where I want to go. Apologize if some of you came in a little bit late because I just delved right into this today. I didn't spare a lot of time. Uh, before I did, uh, let me see here. Where do I want to go? Yes, Ezekiel 16, uh, 12. Uh, here he's talking about Israel and he's talking about his new covenant with Israel. Isaiah's prophesying of that. And verse 12 says, and I will put a jewel on thy forehead and earrings in thy ears and a beautiful crown upon thy head. I was decked with gold and silver, and thy raiment was of fine linen and silk and embroidered work, and thou didst eat fine flour and honey and oil, and thou wast eating uh, exceeding beautiful, and thou didst prosper in, into a kingdom. Uh, see, he put a jewel on thy forehead. Uh, one, of the, one of the things was, someone asked me, he said, how do you know what the jewels are in the day that he made. Number one, notice this, in several places in scriptures I'm giving you today, it talks about a certain day, a certain time, like I read you in Isaiah 26. Uh, the, of course, Job mentioned, uh, you know, uh, when my time comes, but many of these scriptures are talking about the hour uh, uh, the prophetical hour of the early church when Jesus came on the day of Pentecost. No, you know, uh, number one, the jewel in the forehead would be a seal. That's what it's a picture of, that this person's forehead is a jewel. God is, he is uh, putting his name in our forehead. He's writing his name in our foreheads. Uh, he's, uh, Jesus mentions that in the book of Revelations uh, uh, that that the Father's name is going to be written in our foreheads if we're overcomers and make the bride of Jesus Christ. Um, also, consider this, that every, remember the high priest had a precious stone of 12 stones on his garment bearing the, the burden and responsibility of the high priest of the tribe of Israel. And that's a picture of the church. We are, we are uh, spiritual Israel today. We're, you know, the, the Old Testament natural Israel was done away with in the new covenant. And we are the Jerusalem, heavenly Jerusalem today of Israel. And the 12 tribes is just a picture of the encampment of the Lord around uh, the Lord's, uh, kingdom or his uh, holy place, his throne. And so those jewels are mentioned there. The day that he's making them up, that is what those 12 tribe 
precious stones represented for eternity, for everlasting life. God was making up here in, in Malachi. Why would he put it in there that he remembered those? He put in a remembrance, you know, because he's projecting a coming of the Lord, but he didn't leave out the remembrance of those that feared God of the Old Testament worthies. So this chapter, I think, is is very important chapter. Notice again, it's talking about a certain time, a certain day. Um, then um, in... Uh, one of the questions that they had was in Acts, the second chapter, where uh, I'll keep trying to watch if any of you brethren you know, have a, have a comment, a question, or a, uh, <coughs> a scripture you would like for us to use. But in Acts, where Peter was talking, when he got up to preach, and he mentioned that uh, he was talking about, uh, let's, let's start in Acts 2, It says, men and brethren, let me speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried and his sepulchre is with us unto this day. Therefore, being a prophet, knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. He saying that, all right, I'm sorry for the interruption, but I'm gonna to continue to go on today. I hopefully won't have very many of them. Uh, therefore, being uh, this is verse 30, Acts 2. Uh, a prophet, knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that the fruit of his loins, according to his flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. He seeing this before spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell or the grave, neither his flesh did see corruption. This Jesus hath God raised up whereof we are all witnesses. Therefore, being in the right hand of God exalted and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, uh, he hath shed forth that which you may now see and hear. So somebody brought up the point to me that, that David, you would think he would be in that resurrection of Matthew 27, 52, but Peter on the day of Pentecost said he was dead. Well, of course, Peter's, Peter's purpose for mentioning Psalm 16 here and quoting from it is to show that the psalmist was talking about Jesus. He did make the statement that, that David was dead and the sepulcher was with us. But remember what I told you, this is the day of Pentecost. These people resurrected for the purpose of receiving the promise, receiving the baptism of the Holy Ghost and having an opportunity to overcome a sin and inheriting life. I doubt seriously that Peter, that David had resurrected yet. It was after Jesus's resurrection. And I would say that uh, after Peter spoke here, David resurrected from the grave and went into the city. Someone else said to me, they said, well, a lot of these, all right. We're just going to press through with these interruptions. I'm, I'm sorry for it. I, I, I thought I had it fixed, but I will we'll have it fixed by Thursday night. We'll have another live service at 7 p.m. Um, so um, I, I don't have any problem there. Uh, the other answer could be that David possibly because of his sin didn't resurrect, but I think he did because I think God accepted his full repentance but that's the Lord's the judge of that. I'm not. But the other, there may be another point that uh, they weren't aware, aware of who all had resurrected. And, you know, I would think that the apostles would be. I was going to mention, somebody said, well, these, a lot of these people died and was buried in different places. And they would have had a long ways to come to get to Jerusalem uh, after they resurrected. <laughs> 
I don't have any problem whatsoever with that. The Lord doesn't need your ashes. He don't need your dust. All he needs is to speak your name. Just like Job said, he'll call and I'll answer. No matter who you are, the Lord can bring you up anywhere he wants to in up back into a physical condition like Job said, in my flesh, I'll see God. See, one of the things is, saints, we've never, ever experienced seeing a resurrection of the dead, an absolute resurrection. Now, John, go to the book of John with me, the fifth chapter. Uh, in the 25th verse, it says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God and they that hear me shall live. Now, we, we, we generally taught that that was talking about those that were spiritually dead and we're going to be made alive on the day of Pentecost it could also have to do with this 2752 resurrection in the hour see that's a that is a, a prophetical hour is a 15 year period and they they that could have been during Jesus's life death resurrection and after his resurrection a resurrection took place. But then he goes on and says, for as much as the Father hath life, verse 26, in himself, and hath he given to the Son to have life in himself. In other words, he, he can bring forth life and hath given him authority to execute judgment also because he is the Son of Man. Marvel not at this. For the hour is coming in which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice and shall come forth they that have done good unto the resurrection of life and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. So, and to me, it's talking about two resurrections there, the resurrection of the just and the resurrection of the unjust. And many of you know that I teach the resurrection of the just being the Matthew uh, resurrection in Matthew 27, 52, and another resurrection of the just in the end of the last prophetical hour of the Gentile world in the restored church, and that the final resurrection in, Ma in Revelations 20 is the resurrection of the unjust. All of God's people are going to resurrect, and they are all going to meet judgment, and they'll all have an opportunity. The ungodly are not so. So, because they won't stand in judgment. But John certainly shows, that's what I was going to say a minute ago, just because we've never seen or experienced a resurrection. Somebody said, well, somebody in the Old Testament, uh, New Testament should have mentioned this Matthew 27, 52 resurrection if it took place. I said they did. Matthew wrote it in Matthew 27, 52. John wrote it in, in uh, the fifth chapter here. Paul wrote it in the 11th chapter of Hebrews. Let's go there. This chapter is pretty emphatic. In the 11th chapter of, of uh, Hebrews, he speaks in this 11th chapter of all these Old Testament saints that were faithful. Starts off, you know, by faith, April offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. He goes right on down the line through Enoch and and Noah and Abraham and and Sarah and and he just finally says the you know I don't have time to tell you of all of them. Uh, let's see. I'll I'll I'll, I'll end what he, who he's talking about there in verse 37 when he said they were stoned they were sawn asunder were tempted they were slain with sword they wandered about in sheepskins this is hebrews 11:37 and goatskins being destitute afflicted tormented of whom the world was not worthy they wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth and these all 
having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. Remember, Paul, Peter said on the day of Pentecost that this was this baptism of the Holy Ghost they were experiencing was the promise of the Father that you do now see and hear that was taking place on the day of Pentecost. No one received the Holy Ghost before then. None of the Old Testament worthies had an opportunity for it, even though many of them lived just and faithful lives and were more than worthy, uh, you know, to receive the promise of the Father. That's why God resurrected them. That's why he remembered them. We've always taught in the body that there's a book of remembrance and a book of life. Uh, the book of the, uh, the Lamb, uh, the book of life of the Lamb, but these didn't receive this promise. Now look at verse 40. God having provided some better thing for us that they without us should not be made perfect. In other words, they had a hope also, if you'll back up to the 35th verse, it said women received their dead, raised to life again, and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection. They had a hope of a better resurrection than just resurrecting in the end of the world, a better resurrection that they had a hope for. And, but they didn't receive the promise, and they without us, that's talking about the early church ministry, should not be made perfect. They, there, there wasn't a covenant of a newborn experience and a new creature through a new birth available to those under the old covenant. By the way, that wasn't available to many people after the falling away of the church in the dark ages of the Gentile age either. And you would think if God remembered these people that he would remember anyone else that were faithful uh, that went into the book of remembrance for a resurrection. And that's a different subject. Uh, I've, I've talked on that many times. But I'm just trying to go over these scriptures that shows in Matthew 27, 52 that there were saints that resurrected and came out of the graves. I was going to say before, people, somebody said, well, they, they died and were buried in different places. And I said, it's not important. That's not important. God always got to do speak you back into existence. He can put you in existence anywhere. We're talking about God. <laughs> He has power. See, I, it, uh, what about those that die in the sea? How they were they? You think they're going to resurrect and walk across the sea? The, the Lord's going to resurrect them where He wants them resurrected, no doubt. Angels, even Jesus Himself, may have been the one that told them where to go. There were three thousand added there after the day of Pentecost. After. The Holy Ghost was poured out. 3,000 were added. Then 5,000. I have, I have little doubt that possibly many of these that resurrected from the dead, the Old Testament worthies, received the baptism of the Holy Ghost, the promise of the Father, and were, were alive and had an opportunity. And if you did talk about people that, you know, why wouldn't there more said about them in the New Testament? Think about what you're saying. Look at today. Uh, uh, somebody says, is it correct to say some people won't make a resurrection at all? Yes, there's, the ungodly will not stand in judgment. They won't resurrect. They've already judged themselves unworthy, and they won't resurrect. You know, those that are going to resurrect are those that are, that are God's children, both just and unjust. Uh, many of the unjust will, if they're unjust, they may remain unjust still even after a resurrection. It sounds like in Re Revelations 20 in the battle of Gog and Magog that many of those unjust people, uh, saints of God, death, which is the lake of fire. So uh, that's uh, it's sad that many people will resurrect the same spirit they go down in. I'm wanting to have as good a spirit as I can. Okay, I want to mention another scripture or two here. Uh, Luke 23, 43. This is a, a scripture that has to be considered. Luke 23, 
verse 43, Jesus said to the thief on the cross, Verily I say unto you, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Remember in verse 42, he said to Jesus, Remember me, Lord, when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus, and we don't have much explanation of it, but evidently this man hit a humility of reaching out to the Lord and a repentance spirit and attitude, a contrite spirit, and said, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said, this day shalt thou be with me in paradise. That day, Jesus went to the grave and he didn't resurrect for three days, but that was talking again about this specific time, the day of the Lord. He came in, he, uh, uh, on the day of Pentecost, and that was the day of the Lord for that whole dispensation of time, that whole generation, 45 year period, that uh, people entered into God's that's new covenant through a new birth of the Holy Ghost, the Spirit of God, a new cre creature formed in them. Okay, uh, I probably will, you know, I'm almost done, so I probably will close fairly early today, but uh, I apologize again. I have new routers and Wi-Fi is ordered, and hopefully we will not have any more interruptions when we get that done. Uh, it's probably my, but I, I don't know really what's caused it because I've turned my Wi-Fi off and just used cell tower and it, it does it both ways. So I don't know why we're having this interruption. I've done it. I'm having it not only with uh, my iPad, but with my phone also. So I, I hadn't got the answer for it yet. If you go with me to Joel, I want to, I want to just touch on paradise, the thief being granted to be with Christ in paradise. I don't think paradise is heaven. Paradise is just like where Adam and Eve was. They were in the Garden of Eden. Paradise, it's called. Uh, if you go with me to Joel, the second chapter, now I want to show you, remember Peter said on the day of Pentecost, when, when the, the Holy Ghost was being poured out, he said, this is that that was spoken of by the prophet Joel. Joel's prophecy uh, in his his book that he writ, wrote, uh, it was talking about the day of Pentecost. And so here in Joel 2, the first verse, it says, blow the trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. And let all the inhabitants of the earth nigh at hand. See, this is talking about the day of the Lord again. I keep bringing up these specific times talking about today, the day of the Lord. Right. I tried something else right there. Let's see if we stays with us now. Joel 2 verse 2 says, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness, the morning spread upon the mountains. Here it is, a great people and a strong, there have not been ever the like, neither shall be any more after it, even to the years of many generations. Now watch what it says in verse three. A fire devoureth before them, and behind them a flame burneth. See, that's judgment. And a flame burneth, showing that judgment did take place. The land is as the Garden of Eden before them. See, they went into paradise. That's what they headed into, this people, the early church and behind them a desolate wilderness. Yea, nothing shall escape them. That not behind them a desolate wilderness, the falling away of the church, the dark ages of the Gentile age. So that's what came after the harvest of that Jewish world and the end of the Jewish world. And we're not gonna have another harvest down here until the end of this world. But I'm just giving you all these scriptures. When you mount all these scriptures together, it's hard to deny the fact that there was a resurrection after Jesus' resurrection that took place together with his dead body, shall they arise. Yes, after Jesus died and resurrected, there was many saints came out of the graves and were seen of many. I was gonna say earlier, if we experience a resurrection down here, who are you going to tell? Who would you go out and tell your family or someone who doesn't understand this, who would you tell 
you know, Ray Linegar's alive. He resurrected. William Souders is here. Some of the old, some of the saints down through the dark ages, Martin Luther, Huss, Wycliffe, these men, John and Charles Wesley, have resurrected from the dead. You would be carried away in a white, in a stretcher with the, those men in a little white truck. You know, people would think you were nuts and, and you wouldn't want to write it down. You wouldn't want to say much about it and they didn't say much about it in the New Testament, but there's enough said about it to show there is a resurrection of the just and there is one of the unjust. A lot of people think that's the same time. That's another thing that's saying that it's at the same time, at the end, after the thousand years, there'll be a resurrection of the just and the unjust. I don't see that. I do not see anybody in the sea, that's the world, saints of God that's went back into the world, backslid, they're going to resurrect in the resurrection of the unjust. I don't see anybody just in that. And then death and hell. Death is those that are dead. Death is ruling over their body. I would have to use in the book of Revelation the, the same book and the same terminology in the pale horse Death was the rider of the horse. There was no anointing. There was no life of God where those people died. They may have found God, but they but death reigned in their body. They, they couldn't sus be sustained with the life of the Holy Ghost. And hell, they, they died in a re false religious hope, a false religious system. I see no one just in that. I do see those just of these in the book of remembrance, both in the end of the Jewish world and the end of the Gentile world. It's wonderful doctrine. It's a great hope. Don't let anybody sell you away from it. God, time does not change the plan of the Lord. He has an eternal purpose. He's making up his jewels. He made them up in the end of the Jewish world. He's making them up in the end of this world. I want to be, Jesus is our high priest, and I want to be one of the stones. Remember, you're going to give, be given a little white stone, <laughs> precious stone, a Jew, where it is a name that no one can name, but he that receives it. I want to be one of those that is on the garment of the high priest, that helped to make up the 12 tribes of the precious stones of Israel. That's symbolic, I understand that, but I also understand, you know, just like Ezekiel said, he's gonna put a jewel in my forehead. What could be a greater jewel than the character of God himself? We're made after his image. We were made after his image Adam was made after his image. We're made after Adam's image. But when I was born again and made a new creature, that new creature was made after the image of the creator himself. Jehovah, God, hallelujah. God bless your hearts. Remember to pray for all those in our church. Brother, Brother Shelby Weaver needs our prayers. Brother, Brother, uh, Ray and Susan Weaver needs our prayers. Sister Brenda Ratliff needs our prayers. Uh, Sister Mac Fee's sister is dying with cancer. That family needs our prayers. Remember them in prayer. Remember to uh, so keep supporting our church when you're out of a service like this. It certainly can hurt us financially if, and our church has been so responsible to, to either mail in their ties or bring them in the following week. Remember that we still have the bills to pay. And so I want you to know how much I appreciate your, your faithfulness to support, your financial support, your, your, uh, your physical support of being there in a faithful way. God bless your hearts. I love all of you. Pray for me and I'll pray for you. And I hope to see you next Sunday, but I will be back live on the air Thursday night at seven o'clock. God bless your hearts. Have a good day. Bye-bye.